All right. Okay, welcome to Knit University. Uh, this is a four week class that we are teaching on a variety of topics that um, from fibers to gauge to uh, Ravelry to even finishing your knits. So today is our first Knit University and we're going to be covering fiber types and then um, the weights and fiber that uh, uh, you might find in your local yarn shop. So today Valerie is going to be teaching us about the types of yarn. So Valerie, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks. Okay, types of yarn, types of fibers that go into our yarn. Basically, there are two different categories. You have your natural fibers, and then you have your um, synthetics. So the majority of the yarn that we have in the shop are natural fibers. Uh, we have your 100% fiber, like 100% wool, and we also have a lot of blends. And through this, you'll see why we have blends because some fibers are not able to really um, hold up and hold their shape actually on their own. So the first one, let's talk about wool. Uh, two different kinds of processes to make wool yarn. Um, there's the woolen spun and there is a worsted spun, but in the US we call it twist, a twisted spun. Um, the woolen spun, basically you have your wool fibers and they are just spun as is. They're allowed to go into the spinner any which way they want to go. And then um, they are twisted. Yes, I'm trying to think about this. Yeah, they're twisted on their own. And then with the worsted spun or the twisted, the fibers are, they're, held flat, they're laid flat parallel to each other. And then they're put through the spinner and then after the spinner, then they are twisted mechanically on purpose. So we have wool and spun and we have twisted. Also with wool, you have superwash. And if you look through a microscope at wool fibers, there are, um, scales. They're, they lay like shingles on a roof. And with superwash, the scales are either removed or they're suppressed through a process um, and that allows the garment, your project, to be washed and dried without um, fear of it shrinking or felting. So that's wool. There is um, what was I going to say? Oh, one thing that I find very interesting is wool has the ability, it absorbs one third of its weight of water before it actually feels wet to the touch. So wool is very, very soft or very, very warm. And um, it's airy, especially with the, um, the wool and spun. The wool and spun technique gives it the big airy, uh, lofty feel. And Angie, do you have those two skeins of Brooklyn I Tweed? I do. Brooklyn Tweed is a perfect example. Woolen spun is the shelter, and that's the shelter that Angie's holding right now. And you can see it's, you know, it's bumpy, it's very natural. That is a woolen spun yarn. And then Brooklyn Tweed Puri is the worsted spun or the twisted spun. And you can see it's very smooth, very compact. So those, those are the two big examples, I, I think, especially from one yarn company as to woolen spun and then the twisted or the worsted spun yarn based on how you want your project to look. So then with wool, um, you have the merino wool, which is probably the softest wool. And Angie, did you say that merino was from the tummy, from the belly? Well, it can be from different parts of the oh. sheet, but the finest merino. The finest will, merino. Some labels will say finest merino, and that is close to the underbelly of the merino okay. sheet. 
All right. So could be the quality of uh, merino. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Good to know. So we have mohair. Let's go. Let's move on from wool. We have mohair, which comes from the Angora goat. And it, it's extremely lightweight and it's warm and it's soft. Um, it shares many of the properties of wool, but it's not as resilient. And so the majority of the time, mohair is blended with wool. Do we have a mohair blend sample? Well, we do. <gasps> Wonderful. <laughs> Favorite, which is silk cloud. Oh, Let yes. me get a finger of that out for you. There it is. What is the blend of that silk cloud? Um, it is 60 kid mohair uh -huh. and 40 silk. Okay. So Rowan has a mohair as well. And I think mm -hmm. it's 70, 30. And mm -hmm. I think that's why we often gravitate towards the silk cloud because it has more silk in it and mm -hmm. the little thread, which I know you're going to talk about silk that runs through that is yeah. where the mohair is attached. Yeah. And kid mohair is just like what it sounds. It's from the baby goat. Oh. I found that out. So let's just go ahead and talk about silk since Angie has that up. Silk comes from the cocoon of the silkworm and they basically, you know, dismantle these cocoons and separate the fill un untwine this filament, which can be up to 600, 800 yards long in one cocoon, which is totally amazing. But silk is considered a natural animal fiber um, because of the silk worm. Um, and it's used for its strength and its sheen and just like what Angie has there, it used to um, blend with others to make it stronger. All right, cashmere. Cashmere comes from the goat, cashmere goats from China and Tibet. <laughs> Sorry, you just caught my eye there. Um, cashmere is very luxurious. It comes from the belly of cashmere goats. Uh, most of the time it is blended as well because it is expensive and it can be weaker than wool. So it may not hold up. Do we have any cashmere? We have, is that cashmere that we have from Rowan? Is that pure cashmere? Angie, she's frozen. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. I will answer my own question. It is pure cashmere, the one that we have in the shop. Then we have alpaca, which um, super soft, comes from the alpaca animal. It uh, is blended pretty much all of the time because alpaca is very stretchy. It will not hold its shape. It will get larger and stretch out on you. So um, there are times you can use alpaca in something that isn't going to be very fitted. Like if you just want a, a light shawl or a light wrap, but um, sweaters for sure, or anything like that, you definitely need to have it blended with something. Angie, what do you have for alpaca? Um, I have Sima from Shibui, mm -hmm. and this has super baby alpaca. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would bet that it does come from a baby alpaca, yeah. and then thirty percent fine merino. Mm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Shibui has pretty much every fiber known to man. Um, and uh, what was I going to say about alpaca? Oh, they're brushed. They are not sheared. Alpacas are. Mm -hmm. And then we have, um, what else do we have? We talked about silk. We have angora, which comes from rabbits. And we, do we still have angora in the shop? We do. We do. Yeah, we, yeah. Still, we still have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they are, they are brushed. Uh, typically, you... Um, have it blended with something else because an angora fiber is very, very short. And so it needs to be with something to kind of hold it all together. It does shed. So that's something to take into consideration when you use angora. 
Um, uh, Valerie, we do have, we do have this uh, Beatrice, which is a new yarn from Juniper Moon. And it does have 30% Angora. So if you want Ooh. just a little bit of Angora, this would be a nice, it's super soft. I have a project that I'll show on Monday with it, but it's got the Merino wool and, and Angora. So that and combination. And you can mm -hmm. see how it's pretty fuzzy. So that's probably from those short fibers from the Angora, I would say. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's, does anybody have any questions about animal fibers? I don't see any hands raised. <laughs> okay, we'll continue. Let's talk about plant fibers. So cotton, number one plant fiber that we use. Um, all cotton is non-allergenic, so we don't have to worry about allergies. It absorbs moisture quickly and it dries very quickly. Um, let's see, it is, it's not as elastic as wool. So it's a little bit harder to block out if you need to make it bigger because it probably won't do that because it does not stretch very well. Angie, what do we have for cotton in the shop? Well, the nav and then the bud. So the little hearts that I showed this mm -hmm. week are made out of 100% uh, cotton. Mm -hmm. And uh, nav is 100%. And then all of our lines have a cotton, so. Yeah, very nice. And so then with after cotton, then you've got the linen and the linen comes from the flax plant, from the stem of the flax plant. Linen, I know we have a rowan linen. Is it 100% linen? That uh, no, that we, no, that, that creative little, linen. I yeah. have to look. Okay, because 100% linen it can be very stiff. It does soften up over time as you wear it, as you wash it, it will soften up. To, but to begin with, linen is very, very stiff, very lightweight, makes wonderful summer, spring and summer sweaters. And I have a sweater made out of linen, actually, and I do love it. Um, then we have. Uh, we do have, do we have any bamboo in the shop? We no, don't have any bamboo. No, no, we don't. Bamboo is a biosynthetic fiber. It is a natural, which means it comes both natural and synthetic. Bamboo, of course, is the natural plant, but it needs to be processed with a chemical, with a synthetic, so that it can be usable. So they can make a fiber out of it. So it's called biosynthetic. And I think what's interesting about that, Valerie, is I have folks come in wanting bamboo because it's a natural plant fiber. And, mm -hmm. and so you're telling me that that's not really true. It is. I mean, it, because it has to be treated to get to right. the word. We can't just knit a bamboo stick. <laughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. Right. Okay. Interesting. You, can't make, you can't make a yarn out of just 100% bamboo. There's no way it's got to be processed. Okay. So that we, you know, with a chemical or treated somehow so that it can become a fiber that mm -hmm, we can mm -hmm, use. Mm -hmm. So, and then that brings us to our synthetic fibers, acrylic, uh, nylon. Um, Sue Wilkins has something. Let's see what Sue says. This is back to, to, um, wool i think yeah yeah oh do you want me just to say it yeah go ahead um well i noticed when i was making a hat out of um big sexy wool mm -hmm. versus the rasta or rasta it was very loosely like twisted is that the difference in the way they're spun it could very well be you know what i mean like it was yeah I do know what you mean. The Rasta is definitely uh, more airy. Mm -hmm. More wool and spun. More, it's Almost. wool and spun. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and the big sexy wool is more than likely than the twisted spun. That's it's what I want. twisted wondered. after the fact. Mm -hmm. When you get up in those bulkies, which we'll talk about in a minute, but that almost could be roving and a roving is not spun at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what it kind of felt like, like it was just loose, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sort of, not the right word, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Thank you, Sue. Okay. What are we talking? We're talking about nylons and acrylics. So nylons, um, 
they were basically invented for their strengths and they are added to yarns to, to fibers to make them strong. Especially, we all know those of us who knit socks, you've got to have some nylon in your, in your wool so that your sock will hold up. Um, acrylic is basically the same thing, except acrylic is bigger. It's bulkier, it's fluffier. We have, um, we have some acrylics in the shop, especially for babies because you know moms are wanting these things that they can wash and be pretty heavy duty for their little ones and so we have acrylics for that but most of the yarns we have in the shop are our natural fibers whether they're 100 natural fiber or where they're a blend of others so um you want to add anything angie well and your acrylics in nylon and polyester they're all yep. chemically made correct they are. they are actually i read in here um Nylon was invented by DuPont, the chemical company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's where the nylon was first invented. Mm -hmm. That, so that gives you an idea of that, of where it does come from. So, yeah. Okay, very good. Questions about uh, fibers or things that you've run? Be good. Oh, Sandra's got a oh, question. Sandra has one. Um, I was wondering what would be. Um, the reason for wanting bamboo? What are the benefits of it? I think people, they, it's the, the feel and the texture that they're looking for more than anything. I do think that, that, um, you know, especially nowadays, we're all thinking about organic and, you know, being healthy and living clean and bamboo has, I think, been given some of that, but it, we do need to be aware of how it is made so but you know the 100 percent organic bamboo the or, the bamboo part of it would is probably 100 percent organic but the mm -hmm. process of it is not right so. valerie yes i have done some socks out of bamboo a bamboo mm -hmm. blend uh-huh they do not wear like your your wool blend mm -hmm. socks do mm -hmm. you know I, I had beautiful color I loved them but after about three four wearings I would get holes and really? wear marks and they just don't hold up well that's good to know that's good to know I know Angie doesn't carry it in the shop and she really doesn't um I, you know, since I've been there, I haven't seen any inclination for her to start carrying it either. So, and that may be why it's just not a very strong fiber. Yes, Connie, I see you waiting. I see you. Well, I have a couple things. One is yeah. bamboo is very sustainable. Right. So, I mean, it grows really, really fast in forests mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. you know, occasionally we find it around here as a landscape plant. And my mm -hmm. only advice there is be very careful because it can be very invasive. Mm -hmm. like bamboo forests in certain parts of the world. I mean, like grow like crazy. So it is a sustainable fiber for that portion of the fiber. So that's one reason. I also understand that it is antibacterial. So they will weave like sheets and things that are supposed to be more um, air circulating kind of thing, you know, oh, body good. regulating kind of thing. Okay. So sometimes that might be an advantage though I find that interesting. I wonder what they do to make the sheets more durable since yeah. it sounds like it could be a fiber problem. Yeah. And then my other question, uh, the question I had was what exactly is mercerized cotton? That's a term I, we often here. see when we're talking about cotton. What does that mean? You know what? I saw something in here about that, but I didn't go into it. It is, um, it makes the cotton stronger. It says that it is treated with a caustic soda and then it's stretched. And then that makes the cotton stronger and more durable and more lustrous too. So that's probably, because I have seen mercerized cotton sheets actually, and that may be where the lustrous part of that sheet comes from. But good yeah, questions. good question, Connie. Okay, I'm back, thanks. Joyce has a question, do you have or tricks for determining what fiber an unlabeled stash yarn might be. Oh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I well, too. you can you can get a book that has <laughs> things like this on it. <laughs> I don't know. Come into the shop, you know, yeah. and we can start looking around the shop and see what it looks like the most. Um, yeah. I think about um, lighting it on fire. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Has anybody ha anybody heard about that? Wool wool like an burn. acrylic would melt, right? If it's a right, right. An acrylic, any any synthetic is going to melt. Right, yeah. and wool won't burn. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk it's about usually it's between is this an actual wool or is this some acrylic? And I end up just rubbing it on my lip to see whether it makes me angry or not. <laughs> 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 Oh, we are fun. going to talk about how you can determine weight. Now that's an easy one. We can determine yeah. the weight of an unknown labeled yarn, but uh, that's a that's a great question. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Any others about fibers? Oh, I think we're good. Okay, great. Now it's my turn to talk to you about yarn weights and. Um, we're gonna to go to a website that I think you would all find to be very valuable. Uh, so I'm gonna do a screen share here and we'll go to where that is, hopefully. And this website is not the Zoom. It's, it's the, uh, the Craft Yarn Council. So you might write this down. This, is, this has got a wealth of information in it. And um, like it could be a place where someone that wanted to learn to knit could come. Of course, we out knit versus crochet, learn to videos. Um, it's got uh, the knit stitch, the purl stitch, learn to crochet. It's also got the standards. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about standards today. And unfortunately, it would be lovely if the whole industry did follow the standards, but they don't follow the standards because there are as much as we would like, because there are so many yarn manufacturers out there, um, but we will take a look at, at that chart. It's got abbreviations. So if you needed to come and look, let's, uh, look, let's look here at knitting abbreviations. You can click here and it will, you could look up any abbreviation that you might not know. Now you can go and Google that and that often works as well. But I just think this is a really nice, um, a really nice website. The other thing I like about this is, let's see what I, oh, it clicks off. Here we go. Standard body measurements and sizing. So it shows how to do your measurements. So like if you're interested in measuring for a sweater, this is, this would be the guidelines. Lots of times when we're getting to to do our guidelines, we don't know where to do that. There's also the standards for socks. So there's a foot size chart here. So there's for baby, youth, women, men's, just a really nice information about, um, so I'm gonna go to standard yarn weight system. So this you will often see um, we have this printed off at the shop. You could print it off yourself if you'd like to be able to look at that. When we talk about weight, we're talking about the thickness of the yarn. So there is some confusion about um, thinking about, well, my yarn weighs 50 grams or my yarn weighs 100 grams. That doesn't necessarily indicate the thickness of your yarn. And so the standard yarn weight system. Your yarns will have these little, I guess they're little skeins with the numbers on them. And that will identify what uh, type of yarn it is. So we can look at lace. 
super fine, fine. Um, and that would be then called fingering. It talks about how we might refer to these. We don't really call it baby. <laughs> we don't really, we don't call fine baby either. Um, so the, the problem that occurs with yarn weights or yarn thickness is the standards in Europe are different than the standards in America. And in fact, American designers British written pattern might be. So with us being a Rowan uh, flagship store, we have a lot of British wool and uh, British products from the UK and we love them. I mean, they've been doing knitting and yarn for a very long time. A little bit of translation that sometimes doesn't come across the pond, so to speak, uh, to America. The thing that you'll want to pay attention to is what your gauge is. So this will often determine what might be. So you can see it's 33 to 40. And important to look at is that your gauge, your gauge is um, uh, done in stockinette in a four inch swatch. So it's not done in garter, it's not done in pattern, it's not done in anything like that. It is done in stockinette, okay? So that's important for us to, um, important for us to remember as we think about gauge. And next week, Susan's going to be teaching about gauge. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute as it refers to, um, refers to the yarn. So we come on down 27 to 32, 23 to 26, 21 to 24. So we'll often look at your, your pattern and then we'll say, well, um, what kind of yarn are they calling for? Then there are recommended needle sizes as well. So you can see that they've got the metric and they've got the US. And um, interesting enough, many of us will work with our patterns in yardage, yet everything that we, we don't work in ounces, we work in grams. So we're kind of cross. Often that we often will refer to as well. So, um, let's see, I told you about the American manufacturer. So this is a great sheet. You could even print it off. I'm going to take you to another screen share. Question. <laughs> you check while I switch screens here, please. Val, can you check? Can you see the chat? There we go. I missed most of that because you're breaking up. Yeah, sorry. But there are no questions. Okay. Everybody following. Oh, Connie. Oh, I can't. Oh, she does have her hand up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see everybody. everybody. Okay. Now it's down. Okay. Man, that was an old hand. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's okay. We're good. All right. I want to show you a yarn label. And so we can talk about, and then I'm going to talk about wraps per inch as well. So um, let's get this going. And we'll talk a little bit about substituting yarn too. Okay, here is a yarn label. If I freeze up, just ask me to repeat it. Okay. Okay, so some yarn labels have a wealth of information and some yarn labels don't. Um, and that's where wraps per inch might, might come in handy. Up here, we talk about color and dye lot. What we know is that a dye lot is important, especially if you're making a large project that you would want it all to match. There are some tricks that we can do to blend in a dye lot. And sometimes even a dye lot doesn't indicate that it's all going to look the same. That's why the companies we carry here at Knit Paper Scissors, we pay close attention to their reputation, how they put their things together, what they're about, because that does make a difference then when we're 
You see that it says featuring the finest Angora and extra fine merino wool. It's 54%, 30%, and then 16% nylon. So this has become a really popular yarn recently, and they're called a chainette. And the chainette, you can't see it. I think Val, because your Angora is the fuzziness, but it's like a nylon tube. And then they blow the fibers into that nylon tube. So um, this Beatrice is like this. Um, what's the Rowan one? Rush fleece, same, same thing. And that's where the nylon is coming, but it is going to give it quite a bit of strength. So this is good with the Angora and the wool to be able, you know, to be able to have that. Then we come on down and we're going to look at, um, you'll see that it's, this has got both 1.76 ounces, but 50 grams. So that's what we really look for. And then we see that there's 109 or 109 What we know is that yards is about 10% more than meters. And that's, that's kind of true here. So we're seeing it's about nine more yards. So whenever somebody comes in and they have a pattern and it says, well, when I need 70 meters, then we know we're gonna need about 77 yards kind of thing. So it's always 10% more. Here are the wash symbols. And back on the Yarn Craft Council, there's a great little handout that you could print nice. out that has got the different symbols. Now we see that this is bulky, okay? And so if we look back, I'm going to look back on our bulky here. Um, look back on our bulky, we should have a gauge of 12 to 15 stitches. So let's look. She, they have 12 to 15 stitches. So this is a pretty good example of a standardized label. They're suggesting the US needle size nine to 11, and then they have hooks as well as recommended. And remember, this is over stockinette stitch. So this, the craft council or our standardized, our standardized companies would. Here's a Shibui label. So it's gonna be a whole, it's gonna be a lot different in that it's got the content, we see the color, the dye lot, they've got a weight, and then they've got the gauge of 20 stitches. So here's a great example. This they're calling the weight of Shibui as lace. When I look at the lace in the standardized chart, the gauge on that is 33 stitches. So therefore we're back to where a gauge swatch is important. Now this is saying though, 20 stitches on a US seven. So that's where our difference is because a lace weight would typically be done on a double zero, a zero or a one, and then your gauge would be 33. So see, Shibui is saying we like to knit this on a seven at a 20 stitch gauge, okay? So you have to be a little bit of a detective here on your, on your, um, on your labels. Let's look at, let's say you have a product that you do not know what the, la the label's gone and you just don't know. We have this little tool and you could just use a ruler. That would be okay too. This is wraps per inch. And um, what you would do is you would take your yarn and then you would just, you don't want to pull it tight like that. You just are going to let it naturally fall. So I'm going to scooch this down. We're going to wrap it in this way. And um, we're going to see how many wraps per inch, just letting it butt up to each other gently. And um, so it's about four, five inches. And this is Rowan Big Wool. And it's considered bulky. And our stitches is 12 to 15 per inch. So we're right on 
with our um, right on almost a little thinner than like your um, than like your rock. to be a little bulkier they're still both considered bulky but they're completely completely different yarns so a little wraps per inch is a valuable the very best thing to do is to knit a swatch whoop i'm froze am i not froze now okay you're okay but All right. were you we missed the one part were you um did you mention rasta Yes. After that, okay. Yeah, okay. Rasta is Rasta is considered bulky, just like big wool is considered mm -hmm. bulky, mm -hmm. but it is definitely a heavier bulky than uh, than the uh, big wool is. Same about Santa Cruz. Um, that's considered a worst of weight yarn, and so is Blue Sky wool stock. But um, if you were to do the wraps per inch, you would notice that your Santa Cruz is going to be heavy and not as many wraps per inch as your wool stock is going to be. So one of the things that often happens is folks come in and they say, I have this pattern and I don't know what yarn to make it out of. And so one of the places that we will, that I like to, what I like to do with the customer is say, what is it about the pattern you like? Do you like the color? Because sometimes we see the picture and we say, I, I want a pink yarn. I want it just like that. Do you like the drape of the picture? Because we can't necessarily substitute all yarns across the board. Um, if you want a drape, like let's say, as Valerie taught about cotton to wool, they're going to look completely different in the finished product. So there's a number of things you need to think about instead of just saying, well, I want to use this yarn. So yarn substitution um, is best done with a swatch. So next week, again, Susan's going to be teaching on swatches. And swatches aren't just for sweaters. So they're a great way for you to determine what your yarn thickness or weight is. Um, for example, we could have a 50 gram ball and it could have 160 yards on it. So let's just say this one has 160 yards on it. And then I have another one. I don't have that with me as I did the other night. And the same 50 gram ball of a different yarn has 120 yards. That means that that one will be slightly thicker. Okay. So just because they say it's a 50 gram ball that you think, well, that's gonna have the right yardage, not necessarily. That yarn could be a little thinner, that yarn could be a little thicker. That's why a gauge swatch is so critical to helping determine your thickness. Just like we looked on the Shibui, where it said on a seven, 20 stitches, many of us knit weight yarn. So fingering would be like our sock yarn or lazy bee yarn or La Jolla yarn. Um, and if we were knitting that to gauge, we would maybe use a zero, a one, maybe a double zero. But a lot of shawls are knit with a size four needle. And that gives you a looser lay to the fabric, so to speak. So fabric is important. Um, fabric is important in your desire and what you want to achieve. All right, questions, comments, things you've run into. Connie has a question. Okay. Um, I'll read it. Mm -hmm. So she said, so you're saying that the thickness is range. Yes. So the thickness, and if you look at the yarn weight system, they'll say worsted weight. So Val, you were talking earlier about worsted spun. Mm -hmm. That gets a little confusing for us mm -hmm. in a man. It does. Yeah. That's why we call it twisted. Yes, there we go. So the worst to gauge is anywhere from 16 to 20. Okay. So for example, our Santa Cruz might knit at 16, our wool stock might knit at 20 because it's all more on the light end of a worsted weight. 
Good question. And see, I used weight interchangeably, but it is kind of more the thickness of the yarn. All right, what other? Have any of you run into um, uh, any challenges that you'd like us to, to like to share and how you worked it out? Not yet, you're all experts. All right, well, I'm gonna encourage you to make sure to join us next week for the gauge um, because that really fits right in with determining the correct weight of yarn and how that might impact. It'll either be on Monday at seven or this time on the following Thursday. Then the next week is Ravelry and we will be teaching Ravelry. And then the fourth week we'll be teaching caring for your knits, how to finish your knits, blocking uh, and uh, caring for them as well. So this has been fabulous. Thank you, Val. Yes. Thank you very much. That was a lot of information. Good, good. Well, we'll um, be posting it um, on our YouTube channel. Kind of gives us a thumbs up. Thanks. Um, we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel for you to be able to go back and refer to. So we appreciate your, your help with us and all for being on. Oh, lots of thumbs up. Hey, we've got some. Oh, good. That's fun. Everybody's giving us a thumbs up. Do they no, need we've, we've learned. We've learned what this bar is down here. We I know. Play. And we're getting claps. No, there isn't a thumbs down. So I guess they have to give us a thumbs up, right, Val? That's right. There's no, there's no, there's nothing sad or upsetting about our emojis. <laughs> All right. Well, that's what we need in today's world. Uh, we appreciate each of you. Thank you for being on and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye, bye, -bye. everyone. Bye-bye.